Uh, my name is Sasha Meinrath. I'm Vice President of the New America Foundation and run its tech policy arm, the Open Technology Institute. And I do a very good job of passing here in Washington, D.C. Uh, my own work actually began in the late 1990s uh, when fancy new digital technologies like uh, mini disc recorders and those digital cameras with the three and a half inch disc that you had to take three pictures of and pull out and put another one in were just hitting the market. And many of us were thinking, wow, these technologies are perfect for documenting the injustices, discrimination, oppression that we're witnessing in our own communities here in the United States. And in 1999, uh, in Seattle, uh, one of the largest global justice protests of that era took place. And during those protests, a new idea was, in essence, born, this creation of something called an independent media center. And indie media, as this facet of the, the media justice movement became known, helped pioneer a lot of really interesting ideas, ideas like open publishing, participatory news production, even commenting on news stories, radical notions in the late 1990s that are now normative. And following from this single independent media center in Seattle, Indie Media quickly grew to hundreds of IMCs located in nearly every hot spot around the globe. So when tensions flared and when protests occurred, Indie Media was there documenting on the ground reality. And what a lot of us that were involved in this quickly came to realize is once we'd solved the problem of access and adoption of media, digital media production technologies, the true problem that we faced was going to be one of information dissemination. And in the summer of 2000, I put out a call, this is mere months after the battle in Seattle, put out a call to a bunch of local geeks, ham radio operators, et cetera, to meet up at my house, drink some nice home-brewed beer, eat some pizza, eat a metric fuckload of Pringles, which will be important later, uh, and discuss building our own wireless communications infrastructure. Now, given my utter technical naivete, I, I did truly believe this was going to be a really fun little summer project in 2000. 802.11b devices were just beginning to enter the consumer market, uh, and this allowed us to experiment. And with the use of handcrafted Pringles cans antennas, we were able to interlink a few locations around my house. And this humble effort, which began in my living room, grew into something called the CU Wireless Net Network. It evolved into something called the QN Foundation and eventually transmogrified into commo Commotion Wireless, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today. And today, Commotion Wireless is a multi-million dollar, completely open source, freely available global software research and development effort to create ad hoc mesh wireless technologies. Communications technologies that run on everything from smartphones to laptops to home Wi-Fi routers. And by interconnecting all of these wireless devices within a locale, you can create a local area network, a community intranet. And this has profound implications across all facets of society. So to be clear, the Open Technology Institute's goal is nothing less than free, safe, ubiquitous communications for everyone on the planet. And we view our work as helping strengthen the social and economic justice agendas of numerous, of countless different constituencies. Now, 50 years ago, civil society realized that the most efficacious route to bettering our country was through civil disobedience. And today, what we hold up as champions from that era, from Rosa Parks to Malcolm X, we believe that they did the right thing by being part of a sophisticated, nationwide, purposeful intervention. And today, a half century later, I would say that we have a similar responsibility to push that envelope, to demand access to our public airwaves, to engage in electromagnetic jaywalking writ large. Now, Almost everyone here is familiar with the line from our Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men, let me just put that in a sick, uh, are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's what we get taught all the time. But few truly appreciate the rest of that paragraph, which states, all experience hath shown that mankind is more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms of government to which they are accustomed. 
it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Now, when Alexis de Tocqueville visited America in 1831, he consequently wrote Democracy in America. He was commenting on this new quintessentially American social and economic system, a new government whose structure and citizenry were imbued with responsibilities that were quite extraordinary. Right? We were tasked to adapt our government to time and place, to modify it according to circumstances. And in fact, this adaption and modification of society's very foundations are seen as a fundamental duty of being an active citizenry. And today we have a once in a lifetime, perhaps a once in an epoch, opportunity for societal modification. Now, internet freedom is a purposefully nebulous concept. It encompasses notions of social and economic justice, the right to communicate and disseminate information, the opportunity to use online resources without fear of discrimination and retribution. When Hillary Clinton laid out a new foreign policy framework, the crux of this 21st century statecraft was realizing that connectivity in particular, like any powerful tool, was this Faustian bargain. So she summarized it this way. This way. Quote, amid this unprecedented surge in connectivity, we must also recognize that these technologies are not an unmitigated blessing. These tools are also being exploited to undermine human progress and political rights. The same work networks that help organize movements for freedom also enable Al-Qaeda. Now, many people believe it sort of the height of hubris, myself included, for the United States as creators and purveyors of some of the most advanced online surveillance and monitoring technologies on the planet to be a singular champion for internet freedom. On December 17th in 2010, less than a year after Clinton laid down this new framework, uh, Arab Spring was born, right? Mohammed Bouazizi's self-immolation sparked a series of protests that spanned throughout the Middle East. And all of a sudden, issues of online censorship became paramount. All of a sudden, connectivity became paramount. This is, uh, in many ways, uh, the Egyptians' gift to the human rights community. And in fact, our human rights online, writ large, became paramount. Now, my daughter, Clara, she's two years old today. She will never know a world without connectivity. Her notion of the world will not be divided into an online and an offline space. She will expect and live seamless integration between these different worlds. Now in her world, offline and online rights also shouldn't be dichotomous. She will expect that they would be universal. And yet we still have a very long way to go to ensure that our rights in a free society don't end when you log on. So in the US, this is epitomized by SOPA and PIPA, which were born of an unbelievable, unconscionable ignorance of both the technological realities at play and the egregiously bad ramifications where these laws have actually passed. Now, according to the Constitution, clear, copyright is clearly a means to another end. So our Constitution empowers Congress, quote, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive rights of their respective writings and discoveries. And to accomplish this, Congress set a, a term of 14 years. So to put that into perspective, everything from 1999 on back, from movies and, and music to books and video games, would all be in the public domain today. Yay. And today, of course, we know that nothing copyrighted since 1923 has entered the public domain. Is anyone here born before 1923? And so nothing produced in all of our lives has ever hit the public domain if it's been copyrighted. That's horrible. Now, I would argue that piracy is the price we pay to live in a free society. Now, of course, you can't say that in Washington, D.C. It's anathema to this entire institution. But I'd much rather live in a free society than one intent on rooting it out by any means necessary, which is the trajectory that we currently are on. And the internet has first and foremost always been, from its very genesis, about information dissemination. 
I would argue that we have a, a responsibility to act as defenders and as champions for its openness and the fundamental participatory nature of this technology. And after Arab Spring, it's become very clear that oppressive elements are engaging in a far more insidious effort to rein in our freedoms online. And our laissez-faire stances towards the internet can no longer address a particular hard reality, which is that powers both foreign and domestic are seeking unprecedented control over how we communicate, to lock down and control how we communicate, to fetter what otherwise would be a free and participatory medium. And within this context, digital literacy and distributed secure communications are inoculants against these forms of oppression, not just overseas, but here on the home front as well. So historian Richard John wrote a seminal book called Spreading the News. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it, about the original all-American packet-switching network, uh, the United States Post Office, of course. And at one point, nearly 75% of all federal employees were working for the Postal Service. And since 75% of the US government at one point was involved in the post office, it certainly isn't hyperbole to state that the function was considered so central to American identity, so central to democracy, that it was built into the formation of our nation state. And I would argue that the internet has the potential to lay the foundation for 21st century participatory democracy, clearly. Sure, some people are going to use it for illegal means, and that's the price we pay for maintaining and expanding civil society and democracy itself. So today, many of the best minds of our generation are busy building circumvention technologies to support secure, anonymous communications. Regardless of the efforts of oppressive regimes to monitor, surveil, and censor these communications. And most of us, many of us, draw our focus from Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a truly visionary document for 1948, which states that everyone has the right to opinion and expression, and that this right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. So many of us are motivated not by some hatred of copyright, like some fools have claimed, but rather by a profound love for participatory democracy and the communications and the information dissemination that are its fundamental underpinnings. The pent-up demand for communications, especially low-cost and free communications, strikes a chord across humanity. It is, as far as I can tell, a universal desire. And the Commotion Wireless Project is a means to that end. Put simply, these technologies enable us here in this room to create a peer-to-peer -peer communications network using the devices that are already in people's laps and in their pockets to share internet connectivity, to use services and applications that no one has ever dreamed up, and to do so for free. Given the distributed nature of these networks, there's no central point for surveillance, for monitoring, and for control. There's no central point for billing. There's no central point to put the toothpaste back in the tube. And in Washington, D.C., claims are still being made that we can build perfect surveillance mechanisms for copyright enforcement and law enforcement and perfect circumvention tools to prevent surveillance and monitoring. Now, this sounds to me like the paradox of an unstoppable force meeting an immovable object. The question before us really should be not whether we allow these technologies to exist, which is amongst the most educated in DC where the conversation is, but rather what, whether we want these coming transitions, which are inevitable to be graceful or explosive. Now today we have this remarkable opportunity to change the course of humanity, or of human history. So I wanna end my talk with a simple, but I think incredibly important announcement. And I'm dedicating this announcement to all the authoritarian regimes and dictators the oppressive elements in society, the opponents to our free speech and fair use rights that are out there listening today. After a dozen plus years of development, and with the input of an incredible little team that we've assembled at the Open Technology Institute, as well as hundreds 
of talented developers spanning scores of countries around the planet. After tens of thousands of hours of developer time and incorporating multi-million dollar investments in basic research that have pioneered numerous breakthroughs in mesh technology and pushed the very envelope of technological feasibility. This week, we're releasing the beta version of Commotion Wireless, making it available for free on the commotionwireless.net website for anyone, anywhere to download and use. This, thank you. this developer release is freely available for anyone to use, to improve, to hack, as well as for anyone that sees good use of a free, safe, ubiquitous communications. But I want to end by enlisting your help, not just to spread the word, but also to beg your assistance in reminding people that this is a developer release. It is a beta. We expect there are still unfound bugs that could be exploited to undermine the integrity of secure communications. And we don't want people whose lives are on the line using this technology until we've put it through the ringer. So we're looking for you and your friends to bang on this thing, to penetrate it up the wazoo, as some might say, and to ensure that when we get to version 1.0, it's as secure a technology as is humanly possible. What so thank you. On? Thank you for listening. Thank you for blogging and tweeting and helping get the word out. And I look forward to your questions later. Thanks. Um, one question, what does it run on? So it's a multi-platform technology. It currently runs on Android. Does it, do we have iPhone working yet? So right now about Can three or four different op about three or four different operating systems, Android, Linux, soon will be iOS and Windows. Uh, and it also runs on a number of different home Wi-Fi routers and various equipment that you pick up at the big box tech store or online, whichever you prefer. Thanks.